Hi everyone, welcome back to another video where we will be annotating and analysing Romeo and Juliet for GCSE. Um, today's video is going to look at Act 2, Scene 3. So, last time we read, we looked at Act 2, Scene 2, which was the balcony scene, where Romeo and Juliet meet for the first time. And we see the start of their relationship, and it starts to blossom, and then Juliet, towards the end of the scene, requests that Romeo... Um, propose marriage to her if his intentions are truly serious. At the start of Act 2, Scene 3 then, we are about to see Romeo go and speak to Friar Lawrence and ask him to marry him and Juliet. But before that, we're introduced to the Friar alone. So it's Monday morning, Friar Lawrence's cell, so that's kind of you know, his, his, his church where he lives, enter Friar Lawrence alone with a basket. So, in terms of our stage direction, it's the day after the party. So, remember, Act 1, Scene 1 starts Sunday morning. And here we are on Monday morning um, at the start of Act 2, Scene 3. Again, thinking of these ideas, that fast pace with which the play is progressing. Frey Lawrence. The grey-eyed morn smiles on the frowning night, checkering the eastern clouds with streaks of light and flecked darkness like a drunkard reels from fourth day's path and titans fiery wheels. Now ere the sun advance his burning eye, the day to cheer and dank night's dew to dry. So what we've got here straight away is a description of the scene. He says it's a grey morning, smiles on the frowning night. And we might think about the connotations of it being grey there um, as maybe quite um, a negative description but then we do have this idea of light peeping through so maybe we see something that was grey and light starting to poke through so perhaps it's a suggestion that things might be looking up we know Romeo and Juliet have met it also sets the scene for an Elizabethan audience remembering that Romeo and Juliet um, was written in a time when we didn't have fancy stage lighting etc so as these would have mostly been performed during the daytime it tells our Elizabethan audience that he has now grown light as well the friar continues, I must upfill this osier cage of ours with baleful weeds and precious juice flowers. The earth that's nature's mother is her tomb, what is her burying grave that is her womb. And from her womb, children of divers kind, we sucking on a natural bosom find many for many virtues excellent, none but for some, and yet all different. O mickle is the powerful grace that lies in plants, herbs, stones, and their true qualities, for naught so vile that on the earth doth live but to the earth some special good doth give. Not aught so good, but strange from that fair use, revolts from true birth, stumbling on abuse. Virtue itself turns vice being misapplied, and vice sometime by action dignified. So this is a really kind of long speech, an introductory speech from the friar, and he does continue to go on in a moment, which we'll look at in just a second. But first things first, let's have a look at this, the way the friar speaks. He speaks here in rhyming couplets which is a really good structural device that you could talk about, which gives him this kind of mystical and poetic tone. So he seems almost kind of chanting in his speech, which links in with all these ideas about potions and flowers and um, poisons that he discusses as he's talking about the plants. And we see him picking all these, and he's kind of narrating his actions to us as he's picking these plants. We've also got this idea here that the earth has been personified and the ideas of life and death and poison and potion are presented together. So for example, when it says we sucking on her natural bosom find, so we that kind of take from the earth, many for many virtues excellent, none but for some and yet all different. So some things are going to be positive, some things are also going to be curative. So he talks about the differences between poisons and potions here, which links in these kind of life and death, poison, Po sorry, poison and potion with the continuing themes of love and conflict and light and, light and dark that were set out in the prologue. So this kind of carries on those ideas. Looking again at these last two lines here, virtue itself turns vice being misapplied and vice sometime by action dignified, tells us that morals, virtues, versus vices, but vices can be overcome. So it's the idea that things that are bad can be overcome through the right actions. So what we might say here is this is kind of a meta-commentary on a play. So where we use the speech or kind of the actions 
of one of the characters in the play to kind of talk about what the play is about, really. And the friar here tells us that perhaps vices can be overcome by the, the actions of people. And this idea here, then, that perhaps the actions of Romeo and Juliet may help to overcome the vice of the, the war between those two families that we see set out in the prologue and continued through the play. We know that Romeo and Juliet's death will bring the households together, so we see the friar kind of echoing these ideas in his speech. Enter Romeo. This is important because we see that the friar is absorbed in his work. He does not, you know, jump up to greet Romeo. He continues with his task and continues to speak. Within the infant rind of this weak flower, poison hath residence and medicine power. This is important because we understand that the friar knows about plants and he knows about potions and poisons. This is a structural device because his knowledge of potions and poisons is going to become very prevalent later in the play without ruining anything for you. We know this is going to be important. For this being smelt with that part cheers each part, being tasted stays all senses with the heart. Two such opposed kings encamp them still, so this is a metaphor to describe the plants, in man as well as herbs, grace and rude will, and where the worser is predominant, full soon the canker death eats up that plant. Good morrow, father, says Romeo. Benedicte, which is a religious greeting, kind of links in those eyes ears of him being a holy man. What early tongue so sweet saluteth me? Young son, it argues a distempered head so soon to bid good morrow to thy bed. Care keeps his watch in every old man's eye, and where care lodges, sleep will never lie. But where unbruised youth with unstuffed brain doth couch his limbs, their golden sleep doth reign. Therefore thy earliness doth me assure, thou art uproused with some distemperature. Or if not so, then here I hit it right, our Romeo hath not been in bed tonight. So what we see here is that... Um, basically the friar is saying to Romeo, you know, why are you up so early? I can see that you've not been to bed tonight because we know that Romeo has been at the party and he's been in Juliet's garden and we know from the start of the scene that it's early Monday morning. So he's saying, you know, you're either ill, there's some distemperature, some illness, some trouble, or you've not been in bed tonight. Romeo responds, that last is true, the sweeter rest was mine. God pardon sin, wast thou with Rosaline? With Rosaline, my ghostly father, no, I have forgot that name and that name's woe. Here this is important because we see that Romeo and the Friar Lawrence share rhyming couplets in their speech. That is last that that last is true, the sweet arrest was mine, God pardon sin was thou with Rosaline. They rhyme together. And Shakespeare often does this to show a closeness to between characters. So we start to learn about the relationship between Romeo and the Friar here. And he although he is kind of a holy father to Romeo, we kind of get this more kind of paternal um, impression of their relationship as well and the rhyming couplets show their closeness. We also know that Friar Lawrence knows about Romeo's feelings for Rosaline so we can see that they've obviously had conversations about kind of Romeo and his, and his life in the past and that's a little bit of a structural device and we learn a lot about their relationship in these two lines. Friar Lawrence continues, that's my good son, but where hast thou been then? So he says, you know, I'm glad you weren't with Rosaline because you're not married to Rosaline, obviously. So that would be something that would be quite sinful um, to be in, in bed with Rosaline. But he's, he's pleased that that's not where Romeo's been. And again, we see the rhyming couplet here. That's my good son, but where hast thou been then? I'll tell thee ere thou ask it me again. I have been feasting with mine enemy, where on a sudden one hath wounded me. Within thy help and holy physic lies, I bear no hatred, blessed man, for lo, my intercession likewise steads my foe. Be plain, good son, and homely in thy drift, riddling confession finds but riddling shrift. So he's kind of saying, what do you mean, feasting with your enemy? Be plain, he says, be, you know, be, be obvious, you, you're confusing me. Romeo carries on. Then plainly know my heart's dear love is set on the fair daughter of rich Capulet. As mine on hers, so hers is set on mine, and all combined save what thou must com what thou must combine by holy marriage. When and where and how we met, we wooed and made exchange of vow. I'll tell thee as we pass, but this I pray, that, that's, that thou consent to marry us today. So he tells him that he's met Juliet, the daughter of Rich Capulet. They've fallen in love with each other, and Romeo would like to get them married today. So 
here he's telling the friar he wants them to marry him, but we've also got, again, that idea of pace. Events in the play are moving very quickly. And this shocks Friar Lawrence. Have a look at the exclamation mark here. He says, Holy St. Francis, what a change is here. So we can see that, that, that Friar Lawrence kind of verbalises the changes that we ourselves have seen in Romeo's character. Thinking back to Act 1, Scene 4, those weighty and heavy emotions he was feeling when discussing his feelings with Mercutio in contrast to the light imageries, images sorry, that we've had in Act 1, Scene 5 and Act 1, Scene 2. Friar Lawrence states this clearly for us. Holy St. Francis, what a change is here. Is Rosaline that thou didst love so dear, so soon forsaken? Young men's love then lies, not truly in their hearts, but in their eyes. So he's kind of scolding Romeo for being shallow here and for his love being in his his eyes. He's kind of, he's looking at um, Rosaline and he enjoys her beauty rather than him actually loving her with his heart. And this links in again with that fatherly relationship we see between them. It's very similar to that of the nurse and Juliet that we saw in Act 1, Scene 3. He continues, Jesu Maria, what a deal of brine or tears hath washed thy shallow cheeks for Rosaline. He said, you've wasted so many tears on Rosaline. How much salt water thrown away in waste to season love that of it doth not taste. The sun not yet thy sighs from heaven clears, thy old groans yet ringing in mine ancient ears. Lo, here upon thy cheek the stain doth sit of an old tear that is not washed off yet. If how thou wast thyself and these woes thine, though and these woes were all for Rosaline, and art thou changed? Pronounce this sentence then, women may fall when there's no strength in men. So what we see here is saying, but you've wasted so much time on Rosaline, you've come to me crying, you've come to me in tears, there's, you said the stain of the tears for Rosaline hasn't yet washed off your cheek and you've moved on. So here we see that Romeo um, is impulsive. He changes quickly. Which is kind of like what Juliet says about him being not like the inconstant moon in Act 2, Scene 2. But here again we see the fact that Romeo is inconstant. He does change his ideas very, very quickly. Romeo continues. So chides me off for loving Rosaline. For doting, not for loving pupil mine. So Romeo then says, you know... You, he chides me. The chiding is like you would a child. It's something insincere. So he kind of, you know, he scolded him. He's told him off a bit for it. And he said, but you didn't like, you know, you didn't like it. You told me off when I was in love with Rosaline. And Friar Lawrence is saying, yeah, for doting on her, not for loving her, pupil mine. And this word pupil gives us this idea that he is Romeo's teacher. Which is really important. He kind of guides Romeo. And also, he doesn't think he loved Rosaline. He only thought she was doting on her. So we get the sense of Romeo being quite shallow. And bade me bury love, not in a grave to lay one in, another out to have. I pray thee, chide me not. Her I love now, doth grace for grace and love for love allow. The other did not so. Notice also how even when Romeo speaks alone, he speaks in rhyming couplets, showing that he echoes the father's speech. He echoes Friar Lawrence's speech. And this links in with this idea of the friar as a, as a teacher and a guide for Romeo. Let's just write that in. Similar speech patterns. So we can see their closeness. Similar speech patterns. Oh, she knew well thy love did read by rote that could not spell. But come, young waverer, come go with me. In one respect I'll thy assistant be. For this alliance may so happy prove to turn your household's rancour to pure love. So what he's saying here, he says, yes, all right, I'll help you out then. I'll get you married, but not just to help you. But I think that by getting you married, this will help um, turn the rancour, the, 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 the feud between your families. Um, it might make it better. And the friar can kind of see how this might pan out. So he kind of notices the big picture and sees how these things might benefit, you know, the whole society, not just um, him and uh, Romeo and Juliet. We know that, the, we know that this does resolve it, though, because we, we, we see this in the prologue, you know, that they, they bury their parents' strife with their, with their death. So we have got a little bit of it kind of building to a tension point here. Romeo continues, oh, let us hence, I stand on sudden haste. So we've got this idea of pace again. Romeo wants everything to be fast. But Friar Lawrence says, wisely and slow, they stumble that run fast. 
So he cautions him. And it could be an idea, the foreshadowing, that if you rush into things, that you may stumble. Things may not always be what seem. Things might turn, not turn out in the right way. And they exit. So what's important to take from this scene is that the friar is a wise character. He's wise. He knows about potions and poisons. And he knows about Romeo. And he is providing us with this meta-commentary on the ideas in the play. Wisely and slow, they stumble that run fast. He's a cautionary character and a wise one as well. We often see this in Shakespeare's kind of lesser, or more minor characters, is that we tend to have the, the wise lower class characters that help to guide the um, perhaps more foolish and impulsive higher class ones like Romeo. And that's the end of Act 2, Scene 3. Remember that you can come back and watch this video again. Please pause it to add your notes as we go through. Um, watch them again and again and use them for revision. You might pick out something different each time. Also remember that these notes are not um, the be-all and end-all. You can add your own notes and your own ideas in there as well.